so, so first of all, well, well done to Grad Ireland. I believe this is the first uh, live event in three years, so I think it's fantastic. It's obviously a huge turnout. Um, the other thing I want to say is I did show up wearing a tie today. I walked around the room and no, no one else is wearing a tie. So I said, right, first things first, I'm going to ditch the tie, but we'll talk about it maybe in an interview type, uh, type setting. Um, also, just to say about the, uh, the title of today, it's called Interviewing with Confidence, which I think is really good. Uh, I did a talk before, but which was called Surviving Interviews, which I thought was a little bit negative, because obviously, you're, you know, hopefully you'll survive an interview, but this is about interviewing with confidence. So, fingers crossed, basically, you can take a few tips from this. Um, so, just briefly, my own background. Uh, I have worked in the financial recruitment space for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, I graduated from Waterford IT in 2001. I did my thesis at the time on the impact that the internet was having on recruitment. So uh, I'm sure there's very few people here who can remember life before the internet, but we used to use fax machines back then, or the most popular thing was a hand-delivered CV. So uh, I'm not sure, Rory, you probably remember hand-delivered CVs now, but <laughs> not, 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 not many others in the room. So obviously the internet was a big thing and there was uh, various job boards came along. Um, so I set up a business called Engage People in 2016. We're a team based in Dublin. Uh, we primarily recruit in the financial and legal space. So it's accounting, banking, insurance and legal. Uh, and we do recruit in the graduate space as well. So feel, feel free to check us out and I'll talk a little bit at the end. So what I'm going to discuss a little bit today is, first of all, about your selection of role. And I think you've probably had some, uh, there's probably been some other seminars on this, but just to discuss it because it really does have an impact on, I, I know a lot of you are probably waiting for the question around, how, how do I answer the question about, about weaknesses? Okay, but a lot of it really depends on the position you're applying for and applying your natural strengths. And then also that relates to uh, areas basically where either you haven't covered or that may not be natural strengths just yet. So we'll talk about that. Uh, the next piece is then the interview itself and the lead up. And it's really giving yourself the best chance of success. And I think that, that's probably it's a healthy mindset to have, uh, not to be only focused on the outcome. There are so many different moving parts as part of an interview process. And if, you're only think, if your only thought is whether I get the job or whether I don't, it's a high pressure scenario. Whereas if you think to yourself, I'm gonna give myself the best chance of success, I'm gonna prepare well, I'm hopefully going to have a good mindset on the day. I'm going to give it my best shot. If I get the job or I progress on, brilliant. And if I don't, then it's a great learning experience. And I think that's maybe a good mindset to have. So uh, we'll discuss that. And then just about the learning experience after and just to talk about what you can pick and take. Um, so I, I guess I'm fairly well qualified to talk about this in that I probably speak to 10, 15 people a week uh, just after they've interviewed. It's very often for uh, roles at a senior level. <clears throat> so for me, it would be finance directors, chief financial officers, <clears throat> and it's high stakes. They're interviewing for big roles, basically sometimes in different countries. Uh, the interview format is actually, you'd be surprised. I, I know graduate interviews might seem different, but most interviews form, you know, there's a certain um, process to go through and a, cer a certain way to prepare. So I'm gonna touch on some of those pieces. So first of all, um, it, the one thing I would say is when, when I graduated, like, there, there was very few people that I knew who were really, really sure on exactly what they wanted to do. Uh, maybe some of my friends, if their parents were, one of, the, one of the parents was an accountant, they might have said, okay, well, I want to be an accountant. And that's fairly straightforward because you have a good idea, you want to pursue an accountancy qualification, maybe work with one of the accounting firm. That's obviously very good, you know, if, if that's your, the path you're after. I think that's a very good space to, to pursue. Maybe it's a solicitor, may, you know, may, maybe it's an engineer. But that's probably 10, 20% of people. A lot of people are still deciding basically as to what career is right for them. And, and maybe these are a few questions to sort of consider. So ju just to say in relation to the company types, so we're, we're very lucky in Ireland. There's obviously a significant number of multinationals in Ireland, basically a huge number of Google, Facebook, LinkedIn. They all have, they're all big employers here. Um, I'm, I'm gonna make some generalizations about some of the employers basically, and some people like to get in with a big company. Uh, very often a good training program, structured career progression. There's a good benefits package. They generally pay good salaries. You're gonna be working with good people. So there's a lot to like about multinationals and it's definitely in terms of getting that experience, it's certainly very useful. It's not for everyone because some people feel they want to have more of an impact in the business and they feel that maybe working with a company where they're working in the headquarters of the company. So we've mentioned maybe about a large Irish company. So you'll see the likes of Kerry out there, Glombia. There's lots of Irish companies. 
why, why some people like to work maybe with an Irish company. And this is relevant if you're in the UK, further afield, and working within, within the, the, the headquarters of that business. You're working with the decision makers there. Sometimes the salaries may not be as strong as multinationals. It, it really varies. Sometimes the career progression, the benefits package. You know, in general, basically, they're, they're broadly on a par, but it's just something to consider. And some people will say, right, well, I would much prefer to work in the headquarters of an organization, and therefore I can be recognized by the senior management team. And these people are the top people in the company. So the third area is what we call SMEs, and I think it's about 90% of uh, empl employment in most countries is small to medium-sized enterprises. It could be anything from five people to 100 people. Um, the advantage of working with an SME, and there's actually uh, plenty out there of sort of smaller companies, the advantage is that for them to make a hire, it's a big thing for that organization, and it's really, it's really important to that organization that that person works out. And you, you might get more rounded experience, basically rather than working in one department, you might work in a few different departments. You'll get very good broad business exposure because you work with lots and lots of different people. Um, so it's just something to consider. I think with each of the areas, there's always, as with everything, there's pros and cons. But as, as you start to build your list of desirable companies to work with, I would start to factor in some of these things, okay? Now, they're generalizations. So it, it, it's, it, if someone says to me, which is suitable for me, I, I'd say, well, it, it depends what you're looking for yourself. For me, I always wanted to work with companies where there was sort of a headquarters. Um, I would like the idea of working with a multinational, but certainly once I got, you know, two or three years experience, I, w I wanted to work in the headquarters of a business, and then I wanted to start up my own company. And that, that was most important for me, but everyone's different, and I have lots of friends who've had great careers basically work with multinationals. Um, just to mention about the sort of the training program piece, so I'm, I'm a judge of the Grand Ireland Awards and I get to, I'm very lucky I get to have a look at the management training programs, a lot of the intake programs. Um, it, it, it's, there's a lot to like, I would say. You're, you're generally require, you know, decent grades, but that company is hugely committed to helping you on a career path at that point. So, and very often after that three years, there's big opportunities if you stick around in the company or there's opportunities elsewhere. I think for a lot of people, and I was certainly in that boat, was, was I totally decided that I wanted to spend three years with a company? Did I want to be? Did I want to waste their time? Did I want to waste? I just wasn't sure, basically. So, I think though, if you're looking at a, at a graduate training program, and you feel 60, 70 percent, I like the look of this, and you're getting a good vibe, maybe from you know looking at YouTube, looking at videos of people who've maybe been in your situation. I think they're definitely good to consider. So, I, ho I hope that's useful. And then the whole piece around building a priority list is it's having an idea and it just means when you're searching for jobs so there's a big job board out there i'd imagine it's quite difficult if you're thinking wow well, like just you know where do i start with this it's starting to think okay well would i prefer a multinational okay so maybe i'll put a multinational as number one would i prefer to a training program okay cool so you're starting to build a bit of a priority list then at this point and they're maybe the first ones that you go after rather than thinking to yourself okay well i'm going to go here 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 which might be a little bit more difficult but I think speaking to people at the stands today, <clears throat> asking about their experience, what they liked about the company, uh, may maybe looking around, looking at some of the YouTube channels, finding out as much as you can, I, I think you'll get, you'll get some good feedback. So th this is sort of the first piece around uh, strengths and weaknesses. And uh, <clears throat> I, I like actually the fact that people don't call them weaknesses anymore. They call them either work on space or areas of development. So. I, I think doing so this is the McQuaig assessment it's a, it's a it's called the McQuaig word survey it's a psychometric assessment M most personality tests form a similar route basically right they generally take 15 20 minutes I'm not suggesting that they're a hundred percent accurate but I think it's useful right so even when I when I was in I think third or fourth year in school uh, we had a transition year and I think there was some equivalent of this and it was sort of like what what type of career might you be suited to, basically? So I'll just, just to talk briefly through it. So on the first one, you'll see dominant and accepting. Uh, dominant sounds quite negative. It sounds a bit sort of Donald Trump, but some people are, they, they like to make decisions. If they're in a room, they like to be the people who are the ones making the decision. They're happy to speak up. Other people prefer to listen, to, to observe, basically, to take on board all the information. So I'd start to have a think about you know, what type of person maybe are you on that front? You know, it, it, it may not be extreme, you may be slightly more on the dominant side or slightly more on the accepting side. I'm gonna go through the rest of them, but when you're going through this, don't panic if it's not immediate, immediately obvious to you. 
but you should start to get an idea and then maybe talk to some of your friends, your trusted friends, the people who are going to be honest with you, maybe some of your family, maybe, maybe ask them what they think if, if, you're, if you're on the right lines. The next one is it, quite difficult for some people because it's social and analytical. So if you're very high on the yes side or a very high green, you're usually the ones who are first arrived at the party, the last to leave, it's you're chatting to everyone, you love going up to strangers basically, you want to just keep chatting to people the whole time. There's a sort of a saying that, that uh, strangers are friends you haven't met yet, you think everyone is fabulous. It's great, great to have and then the opposite of that, or the other side is analytical facts, decisions. You just like, like, like to call that as it is. Again, extremes are sometimes, you know, it, it could come across um, someone who's a very high on the analytical side are sometimes brutally honest and that's, you know, to, that they can't understand that, you know, that they're, they're just saying it as it is basically and they, they, they wonder why they're offending people but they're, they're just being honest, you know, so if you've got friends like that, some people are very analytical, maybe you have parents, but it's just to maybe think to yourself, okay, so maybe I'm slightly more on the dominant side, maybe on the uh, uh, accepting side, slightly more sociable. The, the jobs that you apply for then, you'll start to be able to build a bit of a picture then as to whether they're the right roles for you. The next one is relaxed and driving. So again, do you prefer to sit back maybe? Are you somewhat relaxed basically about uh, things? Do you like to watch life go by and then make decisions or are you totally in control that you like to be the one re really pushing forward with everything basically? That you're not waiting basically for things to happen, that you are sort of going after them. And then the final one is sort of compliant and independent, basically. So people who are highly compliant, basically, it's a very useful skill set to have. So there's a lot of jobs in the compliance sector, very good, very good uh, project managers, problem solvers. They like to be able to look at the information and make sure everything's accurate. On the independent side, basically, it's people who are, who are constantly tearing it up and saying, well, how can I do this differently? How can I do this differently? Um, so, the McQuaig is accessible, basically, you can go online and do it, but I would say m most, most of those tests basically are broadly, um, you know, they're, 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 they're broadly sort of similar now. So I'll, I'll just give you a minute, just to have a look at that, just to see if it's anything there. So ju just to say as part of the interview process then, so I'm, I'm gonna sort of, th these are sort of top tips. Um, and the, the reason I say, first of all, to be responsive is, um, I think if a company's hiring, they want to know that it's it's high on your priority list, basically, that the application for the role is, is important to you. And therefore, I think if you get an email back or you get a response back, I don't think it has to be like 20 minutes later. I think within 24, 48 hours, it's good to move things forward. And because we recruit at a graduate level, um, it would be somewhat of a frustration from time to time if an email is sent and another email is sent and I'm following up and it's just maybe the message that it brings. Now I totally understand people have exams, they have a lot going on basically, but I, I, I think it's a, it's a healthy enough expectation to look for maybe 48 hours or thereabouts basically because if it drifts down your email and you start to forget about it then it, it may uh, impact your chance of success. Um, obviously the base about spell check everything, I would probably not use smiley faces, uh, I would just keep it reasonably formal basically but you'd be amazed when people are processing information if there are mistakes made i'm very conscious that english isn't always everyone's first language but i think grammarly is very useful i think a spell check is very useful um, so we spoke about the priority list so it's maybe looking at positions that are high on your list and applying for those first of all and putting 80 percent of the work into the 20 percent of the positions that are of most interest to you and I, I i think that's really important that rather than applying for 20 positions maybe pick out the four or five that you're most interested in and spend a good bit of time with them and then maybe work back from there. Um, and then just working backwards maybe for when, it, when it starts to prepare. So thinking, okay, so if I have the interview on, uh, what day is today? Wednesday, if my interview is on Monday of next week, thinking back, okay, well, where do I want to be on Monday? And ideally be in a, in a good headspace then. Um, I, I think it's good to prepare the day before, basically where possible. I think it's really nice to have that morning free where you can, you know, if you want to go for a walk or whatever you like, if you like to go to the gym, but whatever is most, um, whatever you feel is going to be, you know, relax you the most. I think trying to cram that morning is probably going to put you under a little bit of pressure. Um, and just as part of it now, you, you may get an inbound screening call. If you do, 
I, I would just ask to rescale. I would just say it's, it doesn't really suit me to take call just now. Thank you very much for the call. I'd much rather pick a time, basically. And rather than doing that when you're walking down the road or you could be in a car with screaming children or with husbands, wives, partner, whatever it is, much better off to be in a situation whereby um, you're able to talk and you're comfortable at that point. So ju just in terms of the mental preparation, it, it, it's really working backwards, you know, so it's thinking to yourself, how do I want to feel whenever the interview is taking place uh, at that time? And just thinking back from there. And if you're naturally nervous about uh, conducting interviews, which is totally normal, it's maybe thinking back from a relaxation perspective. Okay, so just in your mindset, maybe practicing whenever the interview starts, you know, what, 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 am, what, what way am I hoping to feel? Um, in terms of the research that you do, like, so say if you look at the construction sector at the moment, there's lots of jobs in construction. If you read the newspaper, it's going to tell you about uh, there's major house shortages, but there's lots of houses where, where lots of houses being built where people don't want them to be built. So it's very hard to form a view on that. Whereas if you go to maybe the Construction Industry Federation, uh, or if you go on to uh, some of the, you know, the, the main sort of employer federation groups, you'll get some really good information maybe to do some research there. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and I, I just think it's example, example, example based around skills and behavior. So we'll talk about the interview piece in a little bit more detail. Um, and then just on strengths, it's really picking out specific areas that are of most relevant to you and sort of showing pr pride in that basically. So, um, and we spoke a little bit about the weaknesses piece. So if you bear in mind about say the dominance and accepting piece, if your natural style is that you prefer to be more on the accepting side and someone says, well, tell me about your weaknesses. I would say, well, naturally, basically, I prefer to listen to the facts before a decision is made. Uh, and therefore, some might see that basically that I'm less dominant in that scenario. But to me, basically, it makes sense. And I think then you start to form a video of you about your natural styles, about what you are and what you're not, basically. So it's just more constructive than thinking, OK, well, I can't present or I can't do this or I can't do that. So it's thinking about your sort of your natural style on that front. Um, I'm sure there'll be some more questions about that. Uh, so I'm just going to grab a drink there for a second. Um, so I think the getting getting the basics right, so we, we can have a chat about that. Thanks very much. Um, so the, the, the basics are obviously working backwards from if it's in person, it's showing up on time, you know, get, you know, working out your route. So the two guys who are interviewing for a, a CFO position with a construction company uh, that I'm working with tomorrow, they've both driven to the premises, they've worked out basically what their exact commute is, if they're going to be driving there when it's busy, because they, they want their mindset to be, they don't have to think about that basically. Uh, we had a joke earlier about wearing a tie, we're not wearing a tie. I would just go with something that's quite formal to be honest with you because if you show up, like we, we had a meeting in City Group a couple of weeks ago and uh, everyone was wearing suits and thankfully we were wearing suits, but if we weren't, it would have been on my mind a little bit. So I think I would, I would dress reasonably formal and then if they're not dressed formal then so be it, but if it's the other way around that might impact your mindset a little bit. So I think it's good to give yourself you know, the best chance of success. Um, I think if it's a video meeting, I would wear a smart shirt basically, maybe a blazer. Maybe a tie is overkill, but I would leave it to you. I would probably not wear a t-shirt or a jumper. Um, I've seen it before, basically, and it is something that something that's sort of a commented on occasionally. So the great thing about video is you can practice it. Um, I think most people here have a smartphone, so you'd be able to get a smartphone, take a video of yourself. So maybe just practice, you know. You could have a bit of a joke with your friend, pick out three questions, tell me a bit about yourself, and just practice for a minute, or you can stand it up and just get used to answering those questions. And the more, the more used you are to answer those questions, then you've got, you've got that bank, then you've got that mental preparation. So when it comes to the actual interview itself, you've, you've got the experience of doing it. But I, I, I really think having that preparation beforehand is really, really useful. And I would go with concise answers. So when it comes to a high impact introduction, I, I would try and have something that's interesting and relevant. So it's amazing actually, because what I find sometimes when people have less experience their answers are very short and it's quite hard to build rapport because you're hoping that they might tell you something interesting about themselves, about what they enjoyed about their degree, you know, over the course of maybe two or three minutes. Whereas sometimes if someone very experienced, you can't shut them up. They're still talking 10 or 15 minutes later. And I'm, I'm, if I'm interviewing, I'm thinking like, I'm, I'm trying to be polite, but I'm, I'm waiting to almost interrupt them basically so we can get on with the interview. But I think a good two or three minutes 
high impact introduction. So um, a high impact introduction to me is, uh, so thank you very much for your time. I, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to interview you today. Uh, my name is Paul, basically I grew up in Dublin. I, I did my primary degree in business studies. I, first of all, I really enjoyed playing sport in college and that was a really important piece for me. Um, I think over the last two years, what I've enjoyed most is studying the HRM space and that led me into recruitment. And uh, here I am today, what I like about the role in the organization is X, Y, and Z, basically. And I think if you're able to deliver that, to take your time, uh, and just to be calm in terms of how you're getting that across, I think that's a brilliant start. And I think once you get that, that, that foundation basically going, I think the rest of the interview will flow a lot easier. If it's a very short, if it's like, hi, I'm Paul, I'm from Dublin, thanks for the opportunity, and it's back to them, they, they really want that report to go. So it's sort of a two-way street, basically, in relation to uh, that piece. Um, and as I said, ju just to sort of take your time. So there's plenty going on here. Um, so when I was chatting to Rory, he said, look, there's a lot of questions about weaknesses, so ho hopefully we've touched on this a little bit. So. I would have a look at each job spec basically and make it as relevant as possible, okay? So if you're applying for a position and uh, it says there's four or five different pieces on in terms of the requirements, okay? So first of all, I would talk about your natural strengths, okay? So we spoke about the profiling piece, so whether that's, okay, well, I'm, I would see myself, so maybe assertive is a better word, the dominance for the, for the reason you mentioned. So I would see myself as naturally assertive. Uh, I would be somewhat analytical, which I think might be useful. And then I would pick out one or two areas that's on the job spec and maybe that you feel would be strengths of yours and maybe pick out one or two examples. So, and it really like, and I'm gonna to refer to our YouTube channel, but I interviewed Paul Vance, who's the head of recruitment in KPMG uh, last year. They, they have a huge grad intake. And I asked him, you know, what, what are you expecting? It, it, a lot of people they interview, they don't have experience basically. So he wants to hear a little bit about, um, they, they don't have accounting experience. Have they done work in a local shop basically? Did they act as a treasurer for their sports team? What have they done? And it's just the ability to be able to uh, articulate that. I, I would say almost anything basically is relevant if you can make it relevant to how you how would you how you would foresee it being useful on a day-to-day -day basis in your your role. So, if you feel you have nothing or you're very little, just start small basically and pick out what you think might be strengths. And then on the weaknesses side or areas of improvement, you could say, okay, well. Look, I've identified there's two or three things on the spec here. So one in particular is, I, I know ideally you're looking for someone with a year's accounting experience. I don't have that under my belt just yet, but I've taken the time to practice quite a few payroll courses. I think for my college course, I know my debits and credit at this side. And I think once I have the opportunity, I'm pretty confident I can get sort of, you know, stuck into that basically. But by picking it out and making it as relevant as possible. I think from a general perspective about the, the, the weaknesses piece, um, you could again make reference basically to things that you found challenging over the course of the last few years. So if it was a situation whereby there was one or two subjects, and you don't necessarily want to draw your, you know, their attention. If there's one or two subjects that haven't gone amazingly well, pick out the subjects where you feel you, you've really given 110% effort and you've really managed to upskill in and, and, and how you overcame that challenge. I, I don't think interviewers are trying to catch you out. I, I think the days of uh, pe asking people questions and hoping they'll fail, I, I don't come across it that much. And I think what they're really looking for is to see a, in real life, basically, how you're going to adapt to challenges, how you're going to problem solve. And that, that's really what it's all about. So once someone's in a role, the quicker they can adapt, problem solve, think on their feet, that, that's a very valuable skill set to have. So they're relating these questions in interview to understand. I, I don't necessarily think it's all about, are you going to be suitable for the role if you don't have this skill? They've, they've seen your CV. They've, they've got a pretty good idea at this point, basically, as to what you have and have, haven't covered off. But I think it's how you're thinking on your feet at this point. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. Um, so the five-year plan piece, the tricky question. Some people have a five-year plan. I'd, I'd say very few people have a five-year plan. So if you don't, if you don't I, I, w I certainly wouldn't panic. But I, I would start to think, OK, so I finished my primary degree, or I'm at this stage of my college course. Uh, based on the research that I've done so far, I think okay, like, I like multinationals. I think these job, job titles are suitable. OK, cool. So what do people do when they have two or three years experience? OK, so if I can get into a, a trainee accountant position or a trainee solicitor um, or a sales executive position, and I, I can build two or three years experience, I think the next stage for me, the opportunities would be X, Y, and Z, basically. I think that's demonstrating then that you've done the research. I would say what's really important, right, in this situation is, 
you have to think in, in mind what's in it for them and what's in it for you. And if it's if it's just the poll show and I'm just saying, well, I want to do this and I'm going to get this experience. I'm hoping that's going to lead me on to this. They they may find that interesting, but th their mindset might be, well, that's great. But maybe you're, maybe you're going to ditch us then as soon as you get a year's experience or two years experience. Whereas if you're able to say, okay, so I think what's in it for me is I'm going to get some two or three years good experience. What I'm really hoping is I, I want to be one of your best salespeople, to be honest with you. I want to, you know, help uh, grow the reputation of this company. I want to be able to deliver X, Y, and Z, basically. So it's thinking about the value your role plays in the business, and then it's a win-win. And I, th I think the best, uh, what, our, our business is about alignment and aligning business with talent. And I think when you can uh, demonstrate your skills as being a benefit for the company and vice versa, I think that's, that's a great marriage and a, and a great um, relationship to have. So it's just to be sort of uh, thinking about that, you know, the sort of the two-way street piece. And, and I certainly would practice that basically, you know, what's in it for me and, and sort of what's in it for them. So in terms of making your questions work for you, okay, and I, I think like, because I, I used to speak to people sometimes, oh, you know, I got the dreaded any questions for me and, and so forth. But then I'm thinking like, well, if, if, you, if you're just thinking about how I could look smart here, you've got to value your own career base in this situation. So I would start then thinking, okay, so I've got two or three pieces of criteria here that I'd love to understand. Obviously, you want to give yourself the best chance of success, really promote your experience, but I think you want to really understand what's involved on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the ideal situation is that if a job offer comes back, that you love the job, that it's challenging, that there's a big opportunity there, you can really progress on, it's fulfilling, that 70-80% of the tasks you're involved with that you find challenging, which would be really, really good. So a great question is, uh, so if I was to achieve 10 out of 10 success in the first 6-12 months, what does that look like? I suspect their eyes will light up, to be honest with you, because they'll, they'll be delighted to tell you what's involved, basically. And they, they might put the question back at you, well, what, you know, what do you think involves? And I said, well, I know, I know what's important is that I hit my numbers here, I do this, do that. It'll, it'll depend on the job spec. But I think that's definitely a good question. It gives you a, it gives you a really good understanding of exactly what's involved then, and I would really listen in at that point. Um, I think then looking, you know, what what are the big challenges to overcome? So, first of all, from a business perspective, so you know, for more senior positions, people might try and get okay. So, if this business is to really move the dial in 2022 and 2023, what needs to happen basically? What 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 could speed things up? What could slow things down, basically? So what are the big factors? Now, they might say, okay, well, there's the economic situation here. They've got this here. Okay, cool. And then maybe from a people perspective, what's the most important thing? And then what role could I play then to influence that? And I think that's a really good position for you to understand. And I, I suspect that they'll really welcome that question because their whole mindset about bringing people in uh, from a career path perspective is that they want you to, to stay with the business and add value over the longer term. So it's looking at the macro, what's the big challenge for the business, and then what role can you play? So I'd have a think about how you're gonna phrase that, but it's a really good question, and I suspect basically you'll get a good understanding then about the day-to-day -day side. And that's really valuable because a lot of the time, 95% of the discussion is, uh, is asking you questions, you know, and that's great for them basically, but if you're not finding out much more, you walk out the door, you might get a call the next day, you might be offered the job and you're thinking, well, I, I think I want this job, but I, I don't actually know what's involved. And it's, it's difficult at that point to ring back and say, okay, can you, can you just tell me what's involved with the job? Because the natural time to ask would have been beforehand. So I, I think that they should allow uh, time for you to ask those questions. And, and I, I think you'll, you'll get um, you know, good responses. Um, so we, we discussed that a little bit about the 2023, but what role does a graduate program play? So particularly if you're speaking to graduate employers, what are they hoping the graduate program is going to achieve, basically, for them? And I, I think there'll be no shortage of enthusiasm from their side, which I think would be good. Um, so just from a salary perspective, um, it's so because we, we're generally representing the company, it's not something that's always discussed, basically, as part of an interview. But I, I would totally respect the fact that a lot of people are moving to Dublin, Cork, Limerick, or Galway, and you do need to have a pretty good idea as to what the, what the salary is. I think with some companies, most roles seem to me to be, they advertise a, a band, basically. Um, if the band is very big, you could maybe ask what factors influence it. But I would, it wouldn't be the first question I would ask, and I would a phrase along the lines of, if it's appropriate to ask at this point, I'd love to get an understanding, basically, of what the first year salary or what, what the salary structure looks like and how that evolves. And I probably would say, 
it, it's really, you know, it's one factor for me, but I would be moving from the west of Ireland to Dublin, and it would just, it would, uh, I'd have a better understanding then of that piece, basically, right? And you, you might feel to yourself, well, look, I, I've every right to be, uh, I've every right to ask what the salary is, and you do to a degree, and I think most, well, sorry, you do full stop, and I think most companies probably will, uh, and it's, it's definitely sort of moving that way. But the challenge is that if people ask it straight away, basically, it, it unfortunately, the message that someone's being sending is that you're going to choose them, whichever, whatever role is paying the most salary. That company might feel that their training structure is worth tens of thousands of euro and that they're investing it off their people and they want to pay a good salary, but they want to really invest in your training and development plan. And therefore, other companies might offer 3,000 euro or more, but have far less resources. So I hope that makes sense. And it's, it's really not just related to multinational versus SMEs, because if you think about an SME, it's very often the time of the senior people that you're getting, and that would be valuable. Whereas maybe with bigger companies, they have more of a structured process in place. So when I'm talking about the training programs that exist, there's definitely a lot of investment there. But I would bear in mind so there's some very good SME training programs where you might be working with someone who's a real expert in that space um, that, that might be very valuable. Um, so just posted to how, how am I doing for time? What's the five minutes? Okay, cool. I want a lot of time for questions. So just, just maybe so uh, once it's finished, the three W's, you've probably come across it. What's gone well? What didn't go well? This to me is a very healthy mindset around interviews because you're, you're focused on factors in your control. If you're just thinking, did I get that job or not? Did he, she like me? Uh, are they going to not like me because I've got this, because I've got that? Who knows, to be honest with you. The reality is there could be someone who was just in before you who could have done an internship basically in another company in a very similar sector. That, it, it's incredibly hard to compete with. So I would just think to yourself, if, if you're not successful with this one, on to the next one, on to the next one basically. And you know, I, I worked through the 2008, 2009 downturn extremely challenging there was there was you know dozens hundreds of people applying for one job the market now is much better thankfully there's lots and lots of jobs places packed out here there's boards of jobs so if you're not successful i would think on to the next one but i would do a self-audit what's gone well what didn't go as well what can i address for the next time um i look i think it's nice to send an email the next day thank you very much for your time i really enjoyed it what interests me about the role is x y and z I look forward to hearing back in due course. I think it's a nice thing to do. They're generally sent around. I very often get them sent back to my clients saying, I really like the fact that Tom followed up, basically. I, you know, I thought it was a nice touch. If it's between you and one other person, you've sent a nice note, you know, I don't think it's gonna do any harm. Um, and I would certainly ask for feedback. If you're not, if you're not giving feedback on the spot, I, I would def definitely follow up and say, um, I'd love to get some feedback in relation to um, conversation. There's very often a scoring piece they may or may not share that with you. Um, it, it's good to get constructive feedback, but again, if you don't, you're, you've moved on, basically. I, I wouldn't wait around too much. It's on to the next one and on to the next one. Uh, and look, there's numerous factors, basically. What's in your control is to prepare and, and to be in really good shape for the next one. So uh, I think that's me. Yeah, so just sorry. You're very welcome to connect me on LinkedIn. Please do. Um, and our website, we advertise lots of roles. And then we have a YouTube page. There's actually lots of conversations coming up. I'm speaking to Sinead from Jenison tomorrow. Uh, about graduate hiring and the Paul Vance one I think might be useful. So, uh, back, back to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think it deserves a round of applause. Thank you very much. Cheers. So, unfortunately, we've run slightly over, so we don't have any time for questions at the moment, but I think Paul is happy if you want to go approach him after this is over. He's happy to yeah. take Thanks questions. So, thank you all again for attending and thank you to Paul for his time and insights. Cheers. So, the next uh, seminar will be at a quarter past two, and that's going to be about how to develop your leadership skills. So, make sure it's been intense. Thanks, everyone.